The coming reign of God will involve unexpected reversals of fortune with judgment rooted in mercy. Jesus tells a parable in which the one who humbles himself is exalted and the one who exalts his own righteousness is humbled. A reading from Luke chapter 18. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who, humble, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The word of the Lord. Be Please be seated. Sisters and brothers in faith, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This parable that we heard seems straightforward enough, doesn't it? Um, looks like I could give a one-sentence sermon this morning and then sit down and we could go home and watch the Viking game. It's just all about humility, so be humble. Amen. Right? <laughs> but it's full of traps if you read it. The first trap, how does one actually become humble? Most of the time in my life, I have been humbled, not become humble. Huh. And I would tell you some stories, but I'm a little too embarrassed to tell you those stories. Maybe in private I can tell you one of those. And our culture really doesn't value humility, does it? I mean, would you list humility on your resume? Uh -huh. We value self-made people who achieve great things, people who are successful, people who are winners. Being humble is no way to get ahead. And if you don't toot your own horn, nobody's going to do it for you, right? The second trap. If I ever did somehow achieve humility, how long would it be before my prayer went something like, Thank you, God, that I am not like that self-righteous Pharisee over there. And humility quickly becomes another achievement, a reason for pride, a reason to divide people. And it seems like as soon as we divide people into groups, we have aligned ourselves with the Pharisee, no matter what the groups are, righteous and sinners, self-righteous and humble, Believer and unbeliever, Republican and Democrat, citizen and alien, it's a trap. And every time we do that, we're doomed. Whatever line we draw about who's in and who's out, it turns out that Jesus is over there on the other side of the line that we just drew. And then the third trap, there's another, a third trap. Do you really want God to justify the ungodly? I mean, think about that. Do we really want to lift up the tax collector who lined his pockets and collaborated with the enemy as, what, as kind of what we want our children to be? Is that what we're looking for? Or would you rather have him grow up to be like the Pharisee who really was a good person? He followed the rules. He strove for excellence. He always exceeded expectations. I mean, in, in real life, I never really like it when God justifies those ungodly ones. It's kind of setting a bad precedent. But in those rare moments, when I know that I am one of the ungodly, then this parable sings. This parable is really not about us. That's the trap I always fall into, thinking it's about me and what I should or shouldn't do. But this parable is not about me and you, really. It's about this God of ours, who 
who alone judges the heart and justifies the ungodly. Let's listen again for what this parable tells us about our God. Two men went up to the temple to pray, and I've always imagined it kind of being like a big, dark, empty church on, you know, on Tuesday or something. And two people go in there to pray all alone. That's kind of, what I, when I think of prayer, that's what I assume people are doing. They're doing it alone. But that's probably not what happened. In Jesus' time, prayer and worship were kind of words that were used interchangeably. And so these two guys, they went to worship with all the other people that day. And both of them stood away from the other worshipers by themselves, but for very different reasons. Both of them prayed their prayers publicly, probably out loud. I mean, that changes the story for me. Does it change it for you? Every day at the temple, there would be two services, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And at each service, a lamb would be sacrificed for the sins of the people, and then incense would be burned. And as the smell of the incense filled that place, the people would raise up their prayers to God. And everybody knew, everybody knew that unclean people could not pray. Only after their sins had been forgiven, then God could listen to their prayers. And the Pharisee, he stood way off by himself. He did that because he was following the law religiously. He fasted not once, but twice a week. He tithed not just his net income, but his gross income. He knew from the law that if an unclean worshiper touched him, it would make him kind of unclean too. So he stood off by himself, away from the crowd to stay pure. And then he prayed out loud, thanking God that he was so good and not like all the others in the temple that day. I suppose he did it because he thought of himself as kind of an example to all those other people there about how a good Jew should live. And he was trying to teach others to follow his example. In his prayer, he doesn't ask for anything. He doesn't seem to need anything from God, certainly not forgiveness or anything like that. He's doing pretty well on his own. Thank you very much. He believes in his own ability to please God. If you were God, would you be pleased? The publican stood off by himself, but for another reason. He did not think of himself an example of righteousness. He, do, he, he knew he did not deserve to be there. And as he prayed out loud, he beat his chest. And in the Middle East, even today, only women do that. Men almost never do that. And there are only two times in the whole New Testament that men beat their chests. It's right here in this parable, and then after they've watched Jesus die. Both are moments of profound sorrow. I don't know what happened in this guy's life, but he's hurting. Like when your child is dying, or when your wife leaves you and you know it's your own fault. And this tax collector does not believe in himself. He knows better. All he can do is to cry out to God for mercy. If this man were your child, what would you do? Our time is really not unlike Jesus' time, we're extremely concerned about being right. And once we're right, we can be pretty self-righteous about it. Our country right now is polarized around different political views, both sides thinking they have kind of a corner on the truth. I mean, pick your issue. From immigration to the economy to health care, both sides are pretty sure they're right, and the other side is hopelessly wrong, if not plain evil. <laughs> And neither side has much need for forgiveness, because if you're right, you don't need forgiveness. And neither side has reason to be humble. And it's funny how being right makes us despise our neighbors. Huh? As Jonathan Swift said way back in the 1700s, we have just enough religion in us to make us hate, but not enough to make us love one another. What would it look like if both sides approached their truth in politics as the tax collector did? With a deep sense of their own sin, not just the sin of the others. 
with a deep sense of their own incompleteness, their own need for God. One coming to the temple at the time of the evening sacrifice, that would be about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they would see the slaughtering and cutting up of the sacrificial animals. And then the priest going to the holy place to burn the innocents. You would hear crashing cymbals and loud trumpet blasts. The psalms would be read and the Levite choir would sing. And this is in a time and place when there were no radios. There were nothing like that. You couldn't hear this any other place. And you'd hear these things and you'd experience this and you'd know, you would know in your bones that God is here the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator and the destroyer, the, bigger, the beginning and the end of all things, the one before whom we have nothing to say, much less boast about. And it fills you with fear. But then you smell the incense and you see the smoke rising from the burnt offering. The lamb has died. The moment of atonement for the people's sins, for my sins, has come. It's time to pray. The tax collector is there. He stands far off, anxious not to be seen, sensing his unworthiness to be there at all, much less be with the other people. And in his brokenness, he longs to be a part of it all. He yearns to be made right. And in deep remorse, he pounds his chest and he cries out, Oh God, let it be for me. Let it be for me, a sinner. And there in the temple, this man, so, un so aware of his own unworthiness with nothing to condemn him, longs that the great dramatic atonement sacrifice might apply to him. At the end of the worship service, the Pharisee will leave the temple and return, return home righteous. He was righteous when he arrived. He will be righteous when he goes home. The tax collector came to worship a broken man. He goes home not righteous, but justified justified by the grace and mercy of Almighty God, who alone judges the heart and who alone justifies the ungodly. Thanks be to God. Let it be true for me too, and for you, and for everybody in this room. And for everybody that can hear this good news, all of us, the ungodly.